This topic is literature and entertainment. The first word is action-packed. Action-packed. It's an adjective. This means full of action, danger, and or exciting events. Here are some collocations. We have an action-packed book, an action-packed movie, an action-packed story, an action-packed vacation, and an action-packed weekend. Indiana Jones is a series of action-packed adventure movies. Our vacation was certainly action-packed. We went rock climbing, mountain biking, and surfing. The next word is amateur. Amateur. It's also an adjective. It has a few meanings. Number one, of a thing. Done for pleasure and not professionally. Especially a sport or an artistic activity. Number two, of a thing. Not skillfully done. Number three, of a person. Doing something for pleasure and not professionally. The noun is also amateur. An amateur is a person who does something for pleasure and not professionally. Or a person who is not very skilled at something. For example, you might hear, the builders were a bunch of amateurs. We also have the adjective amateurish. That means the same thing as the second meaning. So not skillfully done. Here are some collocations. Amateur athletics, amateur theater, and then some people, an amateur filmmaker, an amateur golfer, an amateur musician, an amateur photographer, and an amateur singer. Julie's a member of an amateur volleyball team, but she's never played professionally. Critics of the play said that the actor's performances were very amateur. That basically means that they thought the performances weren't very good. They were amateur musicians, but they sounded like professionals. Now we have Blockbuster. Blockbuster. It's a countable noun. A blockbuster is something that is very successful, especially a movie or a book. Blockbusters normally draw large crowds. Sometimes low-budget movies turn out to be blockbusters. She is an incredibly successful author and has written one blockbuster after the next. Now we have box office. Box office. It's a countable noun. It's the place at a cinema or theater where tickets are sold. It's often used figuratively when discussing the success of a movie, play, etc. And now some collocations. We have at the box office, a box office hit, a box office success. Um, both of those mean a movie, play, musical, etc. that made a lot of money. Next we have a box office flop. That's something that didn't make a lot of money. And finally, box office receipts, and box office takings. Both of those mean the money made from 
ticket sales. Despite positive reviews, the movie didn't do very well at the box office. Box office takings are expected to decline as streaming services such as Netflix become more popular. The next word is censorship. Censorship. It's an uncountable noun. Censorship is the practice or system of examining books, movies, news articles, etc. to ban them or to remove parts that are considered offensive or politically dangerous. Let's see the word family. First we have the verb to censor. That means to examine things in this way. And then we have another noun which is censor. That's a person whose job is to censor things. Let's see some collocations. We have censorship of books, movies, plays. Censorship of the media or press. Media or press censorship. And wartime censorship. That's censorship that occurs when a country is at war. Censorship played a major role in Hollywood from the 1930s to the 1960s. Press censorship is a common feature of dictatorial regimes. Now we have the adjective convoluted. Convoluted. This means complicated and difficult to understand, especially speech or writing. The noun is convolution. It's usually used in the plural. Um, convolutions are the complicated details of a story or explanation that make them difficult to follow. Some collocations. We have a convoluted plot, a convoluted sentence, a convoluted speech, and a convoluted story. I stopped reading the book because of its convoluted story. Frank's explanation of what occurred last night was rather convoluted. Now we have draft. Draft. It's a countable noun. It has lots of meanings, but this is the main one. A written version of something that is not yet in its finished form. It might just contain the main ideas. The verb is also draft. And that means to write a draft. Here are a few collocations. A rough draft a first draft, and a final draft. Do you mind reading the first draft of my essay? He's excited about writing his novel. He managed to write a rough draft in only a week. Next we have e-reader. E-reader. This is a countable noun. An e-reader is a small electronic device on which you can store and read books in electronic form. A Kindle is a type of e-reader. Kindles seem to be dominating the e-reader market. Although I prefer reading paper books, e-readers are definitely more practical for traveling. Now we have the verb fictionalize. Fictionalize. In British spelling, it's spelt with an S. This means to write a story or make a movie about a real event or character, but changing some of the real facts or adding imaginary elements. Let's see the word family. First, we have the noun fiction. 
Fiction is stories about imaginary people and events. Next we have the adjective fictional, which means imaginary or from a book or story. And then we have another adjective, which is fictitious. Fictitious means not real. The movie was based on real events, but most of the characters were fictionalized. The author decided to fictionalize parts of the story to make the book more interesting. Now we have gist. Gist. It's a singular noun. This means the main idea or general meaning of a piece of writing or spoken words. Here's a usage tip. It is always preceded by the. For example, can you tell me the gist of the story? For example, the story in a book or a movie. And here's a collocation. To get the gist. That means to understand the main ideas. If someone, for example, is giving too many details about something, sometimes we might interrupt them and say, okay, I get the gist. I didn't understand the entire speech, but I got the gist. The gist of the article is that most of us should exercise more. This word is hackneyed. Hackneyed. It's an adjective. It means used or said so often that it now seems ordinary, boring, or meaningless. Here are some collocations. A hackneyed expression. A hackneyed phrase. A hackneyed plot. And a hackneyed subject. The plot of the novel was predictable and hackneyed. The politician's speech was full of hackneyed expressions. Now we have the adjective heartwarming. Heartwarming. This means causing feelings of happiness due to seeming positive or good. The adverb is heartwarmingly. Here are some collocations. We have a heartwarming book, a heartwarming movie, a heartwarming site, a heartwarming story, and a heartwarming tale. Tale is another word for story, like fairy tale, for example. The movie tells a heartwarming story of an orphan who is reunited with her mother. When George was in hospital, the letters of support he received were heartwarming. Next we have Orwellian. Orwellian. It's an adjective. It means of, relating to, or resembling the works of George Orwell especially his novel 1984, which is about a fictional totalitarian state in the future. 1984 depicts a surveillance state and there are cameras everywhere. Here's a usage tip. There are a few other adjectives in English which are derived from authors' names. For example, Dickensian, Shakespearean, etc. Note, you cannot make an adjective out of any name. So it's best not to try and invent your own adjectives. The movie depicts an Orwellian society in which the lower classes have no freedom and are constantly being watched. Some people say that the way big tech companies handle our data is borderline Orwellian. 
Borderline means almost or very close to. Now we have plot. Plot. It's a countable noun. It has a couple of meanings. Number one, the series of main events in a novel, movie, play, etc. Number two, a secret plan made by a group of people to do something illegal or harmful, especially to harm a person or a government. The verb is also plot. To plot has several meanings, but the main meanings are to write the plot of a novel, play, etc. And to make a secret plan to harm somebody. Here are a few collocations. Uh, these are all for the second meaning, so for the secret plan. We have to foil a plot. That means to prevent it from being successful. To hatch a plot. That means to make or create a plot. And to uncover or discover a plot. I think the meaning of that is quite clear. Um, it means to find out about a plot. The movie had a predictable plot, but it was funny, so I enjoyed it nonetheless. Investigators uncovered the rebels' plot before they were able to carry through with it. Now we have the verb praise. To praise means to express approval of or admiration for something or someone. It is not only used for artistic achievements, but it is often used when talking about books, movies, plays, performances, etc. The noun is also praise. Praise is words that show that you approve of and admire somebody or something. The adjective is praiseworthy, and that means deserving praise. The actor's performance was praised by film critics. The teacher praised George for his hard work this year. Now we have the adjective quirky. Quirky. This means a little strange, but usually in an interesting way. The adverb is quirkily. And we have a couple of nouns. The first one is quirkiness. That's the state of being quirky. And we also have quirk. A quirk is an aspect of somebody's personality or behavior that is a little strange. In the picture, you can see a quirky lamp. Here are some collocations. We have a quirky book, a quirky character, a quirky movie, a quirky personality, and a quirky sense of humor. The TV show Modern Family has often been described as quirky. My colleague has a quirky sense of humor, and he usually keeps me entertained when there's not much to do at work. Now we have the adjective riveting. Riveting means so interesting or exciting that it is difficult to stop watching, reading, listening to, etc. The verb is rivet. To rivet means to attract and keep somebody's attention. It's usually used passively. For example, I was riveted. Here are a few collocations. A riveting book. A riveting movie. A riveting performance. And a riveting story. The series was so riveting that I watched six episodes in one night. His performance in Hamlet was riveting. 
the audience couldn't keep their eyes off him. Next we have skit. Skit. It's a countable noun. A skit is a short performance or piece of writing, especially one that is humorous. Normally when people hear the word skit, they think of a short play. The playwright said that even as a kid, he enjoyed writing skits. A playwright is a person who writes plays. A skit is similar to a sketch, but a sketch is normally something that is more professional and might contain several scenes. Monty Python's Flying Circus was a sketch show, for example. Saturday Night Live is also a sketch show. Next we have thought-provoking. Thought-provoking. This is an adjective. It means making people think a lot about a particular subject. Here are some collocations. We have a thought-provoking article, a thought-provoking book, a thought-provoking essay, a thought-provoking message, a thought-provoking movie, and a thought-provoking script. I read an article about education in the Saturday paper which was rather thought-provoking. Critics said that it was an original and thought-provoking play. The last word for this topic is verbose. Verbose. It's an adjective. It means using or containing more words than are necessary. It is used disapprovingly. The adverb is verbosely. The noun is verbosity. Verbosity is the state or quality of being verbose. Here are a few collocations. We have a verbose article, a verbose explanation, a verbose speaker, a person can be verbose, a verbose style, and verbose language. Legal writing is often convoluted and verbose. I got tired of the author's verbose writing style. I got tired of is another way of saying I got sick of. I'm not looking forward to the speeches. The father of the bride is particularly verbose. Obviously that's something that someone might say at a wedding. During my time off, I didn't go out very much. I decided to mainly stay in to read books and watch movies. I first thought I'd watch an action-packed superhero movie. It was a blockbuster, but I personally thought that there were a few too many action scenes and not enough dialogue. The plot was also incredibly predictable. I then watched a movie which didn't do very well at the box office, but had received a lot of praise from critics. It was a quirky movie, which I thought was going to end in a sad way, but it actually had a heartwarming ending. Next I felt like something a little historical, so I watched a movie set during the Second World War. I didn't learn very much though, and it was clear that much of the story had been heavily fictionalized. I think I'll stick to books and documentaries from now on if I want to learn about history. For a change, I went on YouTube and watched some Monty Python skits. Even though they're old, they still make me laugh. One day, I also went out to a local theatre to see an amateur production of Romeo and Juliet. 
It wasn't bad, but the woman playing Juliet almost fell off the balcony, which sadly caused some laughs in the audience and changed the tone of the rest of the play. I then decided to do a bit of reading. I now mostly read books on my e-reader because it's more practical than carrying around paper books. The first book that I started reading had a very convoluted story and I found the language rather verbose. Once I got the gist of it, I decided life was short and that I was not going to finish it. I then read a book which was banned in some places in the 19th century due to censorship. I honestly didn't find it that shocking, but I can see how it might have been considered scandalous 150 years ago. The next book I read was a dystopian novel about an Orwellian society. Some of the phrases in it were a little hackneyed, but overall I found it quite riveting and thought-provoking. When I finished the book, I suddenly felt inspired to try to write my own novel. I sat down straight away to write a draft, but sadly my motivation had faded by the next day. I think for the moment I'm just going to be an observer and not a creator. 